Hello. In today's lecture, I'll describe a variant of the basic RSA signature scheme that is specified in the PKCS number 1 version 1.5 standard. This was the first standard for any signature scheme, and consequently, many applications implemented this variant of RSA signatures. However, a small omission in the standard, discovered 13 years after the standard was written, allowed RSA signatures to be forged by hand. PKCS number 1, version 1.5, is an early standard for RSA signatures from 1993. PKCS stands for Public Key Cryptographic Standards. This standard was widely used in practice in the 1990s, and so, even though it's outdated, you can still find applications that use this variant of the RSA signature scheme. For example, it's still used to sign service certificates in TLS. To sign a message M of any bit length, Alice does the following. She hashes the message to get the hash value little h, where h is a hash function from an approved list. This list is maintained by a standards organization. The rationale for having a list of hash functions is that it was anticipated that many hash functions might be designed and used over time. Next, Alice formats the hash value h to get a formatted hash value capital M of the same byte length as the modulus n. Suppose that n has byte length k. For concreteness, let's say that k is 384, so the bit length of n is 3072. Alice forms the padded hash value of length k bytes as follows. She inserts the hash value h at the right end of the string. If the hash function were, let's say, SHA-1, then h would be 20 bytes in length. To the left of h is added some fixed encoding of the name of the hash function. This takes 15 bytes. The encoding is specified in the standards. Then to its left is a 00, zero byte, and then a string of FF bytes. Recall that f in hexadecimal is 1111 in binary, so the string of FF bytes is a string of all ones in binary. Finally, you have the 01 byte and the 00 byte. The final padded hash value has byte length k bytes. The reason for the first byte of 00 is to ensure that the integer representation of capital M is less than the modulus n. The next byte 01 is a version number. The reason for the string of FF bytes is to ensure that the padded hash value capital M is a large integer whose bit length is close to that of n. This prevents the chosen ciphertext attack that I mentioned is effective on the basic RSA signature scheme. The reason for the 00, zero byte after the string of FF bytes is to enable someone who is parsing the bytes of the padded hash value from left to right to know where the padding ends. Alice then computes the eth root s of the padded hash value m by raising m to the power of her private key d modulo n. Alice's sign message is comprised of the message m and the signature s. To verify Alice's sign message, Bob does the following. He first obtains, somehow, an authentic copy of Alice's public key NE. He then computes S to the power E modulo N, and the resulting number M is written as a byte string of length K. Recall again that K is the byte length of Alice's RSA modulus N. He then checks that M is correctly formatted, beginning with the leftmost byte. So, he verifies that the leftmost byte of M is 00. zero. If not, he rejects the signature. The second leftmost byte should be 01, otherwise the signature is rejected. 
The 01 byte should be followed by a string of consecutive FF bytes, followed by a 00 byte. If not, then the signature is rejected. Then, from the next 15 bytes, Bob obtains the name of the hash function. Let's suppose this is SHA-1. Since SHA-1 produces hash values that are 20 bytes in length, Bob then extracts little h from the next 20 bytes. So Bob then verifies that little h is the hash of the message. He computes h primed by hashing m with SHA-1 and accepts the signature if and only if h equals h primed. This is how signature verification was ascribed in the PKCS number 1 version 1.5 standard. However, there is a very subtle omission in the description. This subtle omission, discovered by Daniel Blickenblocker in 2006, led to faulty implementations which allowed RSA signatures to be forged by hand. You might pause the video now and take a few minutes to see if you can spot this very subtle omission in the verification description. The omission was an explicit check that there are no leftover bytes after H. In other words, the string M does not look like this. One way to prevent the attack is to check that there are no bytes to the right of H. Bleakenblocker's attack makes the following assumptions. The first assumption is that the encryption exponent E is 3. In fact, an encryption exponent 3 is commonly used in practice. This is because signature verification, where the operation is raising s to the power e modulo n, is then very efficient because e is only 3. The second assumption is that the hash function is SHA-1. This assumption is without loss of generality. The third assumption is that the RSA modulus n has bit length 3072. This is also without loss of generality. The fourth assumption, which is critical for the attack to work, is that the verifier does not check that there are no more bytes after little h. As it turns out, this omission was present in most implementations of the signature standard, including in OpenSSL, Firefox, Adobe Acrobat, Sun's Java library, and so on. Here then is Blickenblocker's attack. The adversary selects the message little m and computes its hash. She then forms the bit string capital D of bit length 288 bits. D is comprised of the hash value, which I'm taking to be 20 bytes, or 160 bits, then the hash name, which is 15 bytes, followed by the byte 00. She lets capital N be the integer 2 to the 288 minus D. Note that D is positive because D has bit length 288, and so D is less than 2 to the 288 minus 1. The adversary then checks that 3 divides n. If not, then she modifies m slightly, perhaps in 1 or 2 bits, and goes back to step 2. After about 3 iterations, she expects that n will be divisible by 3. Finally, she defines the integer s to be 2 to the 1019 minus 2 to the 34 times n divided by 3. Note that s is indeed an integer, since 3 divides n. And that's it. The adversary outputs ms as her forgery on Alice's signature. Observe that the attack requires very little computation. Essentially, the only work that is required is to compute the hash of the message, perhaps around three times. So this is a very fast attack and justifies the title, Breaking RSA Signatures by Hand. 
let me prove that the signed message that the adversary produces will be accepted by the faulty verifier. The verifier begins by computing capital M as s to the power e modulo n, where e equals 3. I'll expand this binomial term using the expansion for x minus y cubed. So I get x cubed minus 3x squared times y plus 3x times y squared minus y cubed. I'll next replace n by 2 to the 288 minus d, and I'll call the two terms on the right garbage. You should check that garbage is non-negative and less than 2 to the 2072. Now, the mod n is not required since the number is non-negative and less than n. Since you don't need to divide the number by n and take its remainder, the mod n operation is redundant. Next, I'll multiply out the second term and rearrange to get this expression. Lastly, let me write m as a binary string of length 3072. I'll number the bits in the binary representation starting at 0 and ending at 3071. The garbage term appears in the rightmost 2072 bits of m. The next term on the left of garbage is the number d, shifted over 2072 bits. Recall that d is a 288-bit number beginning with the 00 byte, then the hash name, and then the hash value. The term 2 to the 697 minus 1 in binary is a string of 697 ones. This string begins at bit position 2360 and ends at bit position 3056. So there is a 1-bit followed by 696 bits, the latter being a hexadecimal string of FF bytes. This leaves us with 7 bits left over, which are 0 bits. So this is the binary representation of M expressed as a 3072-bit number. So the verifier confirms that the first byte is 00, zero the next byte is zero 01, she then steps through the FF bytes until she gets to the 00, zero byte. She extracts the hash name from the next 15 bytes and the hash value from the next 20 bytes. The hash value is correct since H was chosen to be the hash of the message M. The verifier does not notice that there are garbage bytes after H, and so the verifier accepts the signed message. This proves that Bleakenblocker's attack works. A countermeasure to Bleakenblocker's attack is, of course, a check in step 5 that there are no more bytes after the hash value has been extracted. It's very striking that the small omission in the description of signature verification in the PKCS standard led to devastating attacks in many deployments of RSA signatures. This episode offers two lessons. The first is that seemingly small errors and implementations of cryptographic algorithms can have devastating consequences. The second lesson is the importance of clear communications, in this case, providing clear descriptions of cryptographic algorithms that might be read by developers who aren't necessarily experts in cryptography. We'll next study elliptic curve cryptography, the most widely used family of public key cryptosystems as of 2024. Chapter 8 will be comprised of five lectures which will conclude this Crypto 101 course on cryptographic building blocks. I look forward to seeing you in V8.